We're mixing it up a little bit in today's video, and before you click away, give me about 20 seconds to intro this video, and then you can assess whether or not it's worth your time. A lot of you have found my channel because of the film breakdowns I do, getting up on the whiteboard and talking X's and O's. But there's also a lot of you guys that follow me on other social media channels, in which I talk a lot about my story. I once was a big time college football recruit, things didn't work out for me in college, now I'm 26, navigating the, uh, the transition out of athletics into the real world. From time to time, I post content related to those subjects, and that's what this video is going to be about. I want there to be an off the gridiron, outside of football pillar to this YouTube channel. And this video is gonna be the first of many in this outside of football lane. There's probably also a bunch of you at this point saying, what the heck, I thought this guy was just a Joe Burrow lookalike breaking down film on the whiteboard. And that's why I'm posting this video. It was a cool conversation I had about a month ago. We talked my recruiting journey, my playing journey, and then now the journey of me navigating the post football life. But right now, I'll shut up, enjoy the video. My guy, Max Brown. And Max is a former quarterback at USC and Pittsburgh. He's regarded by some as the biggest bust in college football history and now uses his social channels to talk about dealing with not living up to expectations in this very connected and public world that we live in. Max is currently 25 and finding his way in the next phase of life. Max, welcome to the show, my dude. Hey, it's great to be here. I appreciate that intro too. Usually uh, people kind of dance around the harsh realities of my situation. So I uh, respect and like how you went, uh, went right at it. How were you able to manage all of that attention at such a young age and, and just talk about some of the ramifications of that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and and to, to me to start, it's, it's kind of funny because I'll get variations of that question a bunch. And there's part of me that I didn't know any different. And, and what kind of what I mean by that is, as you get older, the, your, your perspective gets wider and wider. But for me at five years old, like my family was well known in the community. My brother was a big time quarterback in the community. And on many of my teams, the, the, the best athlete on my team, I was kind of the guy that had to go and win the baseball game or, or, or score 30 points in a basketball game or do that. And so from a very early age, I mean, we're talking first, second, third, fourth grade, like that pressure and it's all relative, but I, I felt like that was just part of like who I was. And so as you get older and that middle school pressure because, or that the pressure middle school becomes, Hey, are you going to be the next high school quarterback in the community? And then when you get to high school for me and my story, I had to replace the, uh, the number one quarterback in the country um, back in 2010. And so he was like the dude, the five-star guy. And so now we're talking ninth, 10th grade. Like I didn't know a life without it. I was born with a lot of things that I'm very blessed and fortunate to have. And I felt like internally there was something in me that felt responsible to make the most of those tools and those gifts. And uh, that was kind of always the, the inner driving force with me at five and at 15 and at 25 as well. I know, and I'm probably going to butcher this guy's name. It was one of your teammates in high school, I believe, Nick Splendorio. Yep. Perfect. It's my, my best friend. Hey, he, he said in one of these videos I watched that you were the most competitive guy he had ever met. And I'm curious to know, post-athletics, how have you been able to channel that competitive spirit? That competitive drive is the key question when you talk about trans transitioning out of uh, athletics. And the harsh reality is, I don't think I'll ever get back to that competitive element that I had during football. I think that's the reality of what it is. And I'm big on not trying to spin things to make yourself feel better or try to look at things like in a certain way and, and kind of spin it, I guess. I'm big on not doing that. And I think part of me is being real of like, hey, I, I might not ever get that competitive drive back with football, but what I can do is I've been in that fire and how do I transition that fire into the next aspect of life? And for me, like I've gotten on a, on a Peloton craze the last month. And for me, like seeing that, that leaderboard, like that competitive, I know that dude on that leaderboard has not been in those 6 a.m. workouts, has not done those Navy SEAL workouts. And that thread uh, has its way in all aspects of life with business, showing up early, staying late, doing the tasks that other people don't want to do. Um, all those little things, uh, I think I translate from football and that competitive mentality into my life uh, now a little bit. In relation to your career at Skyline, like how much of the hype and how much of the recognition do you feel like you were worthy of? 
um, like, what was the competition like? Because, you know, I grew up or I just spent six years in Miami. So I've seen what high school football is like there. And then obviously a place like Southern California, where you have all this talent coming out. So do you feel like you were the best player? You were the best quarterback? Because there were some other guys, right? Like was Baker Mayfield and Jared Goff in your high school class? They were, yeah, and and uh, Jared was uh, a top guy on the West Coast. wasn't recruited as much, but uh, and and Baker was. I mean, everyone kind of knows Baker's story. Had a few offers, but then went the walk on route. But uh, yeah, to answer your question, I mean, humbly, yes, and uh, that, that's that's kind of a big part of my story now. Is for those that, that don't know my backstory, like I was supposed to be the next Peyton Manning. Like that, that was the, the the talking point, I guess you could say. And obviously, my career didn't work out. And naturally, I get questions all the time of. Well, why didn't it work out? Were you not good enough? Maybe you went to a weaker high, or you're, or you're from a weaker, uh, weaker state and whatnot. And I get all that. I'll wear all that. But, but to a man, I mean, my high school team was legit. We were a top 20 team in the country, putting out D1 guys and had a lot of very good high school players, which you don't usually hear. And I'm wary of that as a public school in, in the Seattle area. But uh, it was legit. We did a lot of good things. I was grateful to have a lot of good teammates, but it, it's easy to look back and be like, oh yeah, like maybe the, the ratings were wrong. And I think there, there certainly is something to be said about that. Was I the next Peyton Manning? No, obviously not. Things didn't work out. But I do think looking back that from an early age, I put in the work uh, necessary to earn that, um, that reward and that honor and had a bunch of unreal, uh, unreal teammates as well that uh, deserve a lot of credit and that reward as well. Yeah. And it's interesting because before I kind of dove in deeper to your story, I was like, did this dude like just get to SC and get brought in by the frat scene? Like the girls, was he snorting lines? Was he just, was he just full of himself in that capacity, which oftentimes is the case when you have so much, uh, so much love around you, so much recognition and praise at an early age, but from all accounts, like you were busting your ass day in and day out and putting in the reps and uh, your first year at SC, I I believe there was four different head coaches, right? Yeah, there were three, but uh, over the course of all four years at USC, I had four, but yeah, three head coaches that first year. So it would, my intuition tells me that that type of volatility would also take a toll on you in terms of like the lack of consistency. Yeah. That first chunk you said is one of the hardest parts for me to stomach for my loved ones to stomach for when I'm in these podcasts of trying to explain, because you're right. Usually when five-star guys don't work out, it's a, it's a sex money, drugs, something, something went wrong. Like they, they got off the track and that is most of the time the deal for me. I genuinely look back and I say this humbly, but I, I feel like I did everything necessary to have success. And I know when I say that people are going to be like, Oh, like, come on, there's always something more you could do. And you're right. You can always do another rep. You can always, always do another rep. But I prided myself and hung my hat on my work ethic. And that made it that much harder when things didn't work out to be like, I don't know why they didn't work out. There isn't a great answer. I literally was in a job interview yesterday. I'm not even kidding you. Where someone asked me a verbiage of that same exact question. And it's weird there because I feel arrogant sitting there saying, no, I felt like I did everything I needed to do. But that's the truth. And I feel obligated to say the truth because I know there's other people out there like me in their own lane that also feel like they put in the work to get to a specific college or get a job or date a certain person or whatever. And things don't work out. And oftentimes people kind of say, oh, well, there's always something you could have done and all that. And self-reflection is key. Don't get me wrong. But I I do always kind of feel obligated to to speak my truth. Uh, But for those that don't know, Gary, I mean, it's the work ethic. It's the perspective. It's the accountability. Um, a lot of people are not fans of Gary because Gary is very blunt and he, and, and that rubs people the wrong way. But the reality is the people that it rubs the wrong way probably need to hear Gary's message the most because you need that accountability. You need that. Hey, it's not always sunshine and rainbows. It's a grind. It's a work ethic, but that doesn't mean that it has to be something that's negative. And that's a, that's a big misconception that I think a lot of people have is, work ethic means bad. Working hard means bad. No, working hard means a lot, can mean a lot of fulfillment, can mean a lot of happiness, can mean a lot of relationships and a lot of valuable things there. And I think just his mentality and uh, you're a fan of his obviously. And I think everything he preaches in his videos, he lives on a day-to-day basis. And it was awesome to be exposed to that. Also with all the social media learnings and, and more of the technical stuff as well. 
And one of the things I've heard you talk about is the idea of not being so hard on yourself, this idea of non-judgment, which I think is really critical. And I know that's something he touches on too. It's like 100% accountability and ownership of your life, but also don't overjudge yourself in the process because then that's going to lead to burnout, self-sabotage, and these other things. Talk a little bit about non-judgment and what exactly that means to you. You're asking some good questions, brother. I love this. A lot of these points are, uh, are, are right on cue for me. And I love the topic of, of self-judgment or, 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 or trying to put that away because I know for me at 18, 19 years old, I would always hear that, but I could never relate to that. Like I was like, stop judging yourself. Like, but what, what do you mean? Like, I'm not judged. Like I, it, it didn't process. And then it finally kicked into me in the fall of 2014 where I, was, I wasn't playing my best football for a very long time. And that was something the sports like I was working with on was tell me, stop being so hard on yourself. Stop judging yourself. And it's this fine line of, we talk about the Mamba mentality, rest in peace, uh, Kobe, where he is, he's very hard on himself, right? And that's that he, 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 he struck a, a healthy balance of pushing himself and pushing himself. But there's a fine line if it gets too far of, you're very judgmental of yourself and it starts working against you. And I feel like in that phase of my life, that competitor mentality was doing working against me because I was like, gosh, dang it, Max, why can't you throw that football? Why can't you run that? Why can't you execute that play? Why aren't you playing? I was judging myself really hard and it finally hit me straight in the face. Like I can't do that. But this realization that self-judgment absolutely eats away at you. And that's something that uh, I feel like I'm way better at now. Love how Gary preaches on that. And it, it's such a, it's such a impactful factor. Like these past couple of days, uh, I'm, I've been doing job interviews and whatnot, had a little bit of uh, anxiety in terms of trying to figure it out, but it's like right away is right when I start feeling myself get anxious or worried about kind of what's, what the next step is trying to get a job locked in before the new year. Like you can get frustrated with yourself, but it's max. Don't judge yourself. Just keep putting in good work. Keep doing what you need to do. Chips will fall where, where they may. And that peace but that, that, that comes about as a result of not judging yourself. You can push yourself but not judging your daily actions, I think is so healthy. Something that the reality is a lot of people struggle with, I think when they get into darker times and it's uh, such a key piece that, uh, that Gary really champions in uh, a lot of his content. Not beating around the bush, just being as blunt and, and authentic as possible. So I appreciate you doing that. I know that mindset's brought me a lot of peace in my life and I'm lucky enough where it doesn't being authentic, especially on social media, it doesn't feel like something I'm like trying to do. It just feels like something that's just like, that's what I need to do. Like the idea of like fronting and all that, just like, I'm not even trying to be on my high horse here. It just, it doesn't really relate to me that much. And I think a lot of that has to do with how my playing career played out in which like everything, all my dirty laundry or whatever, all my failures were out there for the world to see. So that mindset has kind of carried over into my social media uh, practices, I guess. But the accountability, the being truthful, being real brought me a lot of peace and happiness, uh, especially in times, the times that, uh, we're not the, we're not the greatest in my life. Regardless of everything else, you got a free education at a super dope school. You got these lifelong lessons that you're just going to use to create that momentum in your life. No doubt. And, uh, I, I will push back uh, a little bit because, you're totally right. You didn't say anything I disagree with, but I also level with like, there's a lot of people that talk to me about my story of when I am harsh and I say, Hey, no, I failed at my football career. Like I didn't get it done. You mentioned it in the intro I'm, by some publications, the biggest bust in college football, or at least one of the biggest busts the last decade. And so when people try to tell me, Oh, well, Max, you got a great education. Like I respect that. But that's not, that wasn't the goal. The goal was to be in the NFL. And I respect guys that, hey, that might be harsh and I'm not naive to how blessed I was to go to USC. Don't get me wrong. But I also know that the mentality when that's the expectation and that's what you're waking up every day, every day to attack and it doesn't happen, that there's some pain there. There's some hardship. And I know, I know you know this, but I, I push back a little bit because in my life, I know a lot of people have framed their response like that and it doesn't relate to me. I know it doesn't relate to a lot of people with whatever your goal is, right? It's, hey, I wanted to get into Harvard. I didn't get it. And I went to wherever, like that's going to sting. And I think, yes, have the perspective to still be wary that, hey, you still had a great option or you still like life had its plan. 
But I think it's healthy to acknowledge and not try to spin it in your brain that things didn't work out because it allows you to take accountability for that and then move forward with a cleaner vision in my experience and how it relates to, to my life personally. Things I think a lot of where, where I'm wired today is constantly looking back on those experiences and making it a point to remind myself to use those experiences in the here and now to explain it a little bit differently. I think oftentimes, right, people go through experiences and then better for good or for bad. And they're constantly trying to get better, constantly trying to get better, which I absolutely love, but then they don't use that learning or use that experience in their here and now, like, no, you just went through that for better or for worse. Let's use that now. Let's use that teaching now. And I think a lot of times, especially, and I see it all the time in the Gary V world, of people constantly trying to learn and pick from Gary and all these things. And Gary will say it in his content. He says, Hey, it would make nothing would make me more happy if you stopped watching my content and actually implemented those things actually took action on those things. And so it's not apples to apples, but I think there's part of my life of like, Hey, no, I went through that shit. Like it sucked. And now I'm going to try to in my life right now, have perspective that it's not like the times in 2016 or the shoulder surgery, like, it might suck to wake up tomorrow at 6 a.m., but it's not as bad as ripping your shoulder out of the socket. Mm-hmm. Like that type of mentality is, I guess, how I try to wire myself just on a, on a day-to-day basis. I try to have mindfulness be a trait that I have rather than a state that I need to get into. And that's kind of how I look yeah. at it a little bit there. Did did you ever like have any interaction with guys like Nick Saban? Because I know Alabama recruited you and Bob Stoops from Oklahoma. I did two cool stories uh, with both of them. I remember uh, it was my birthday, probably my junior year of high school, I think it was, or just before. And I was in art class first period uh, at Skyline High School. And uh, my coach came storming in the door and everyone kind of knew who he was. He was a teacher at the school and he kind of looks at my art teacher and like points at me and says, "I I need him. And he said it, he didn't even ask. He was like forceful with it. And I could tell he had this look on his face. I could tell something was up. And he had done that in the past a little bit of he'll poke, he would poke his head into my class and say, I need Max. And I would go out there and say hi to a coach or get on the phone or something. And uh, that was kind of just the, the deal a little bit, but I could tell this one was different. And he said, like, there's some, someone on the phone for you. And it was, uh, it was Nick Saban. And I remember uh, having a phone call with him in just the cafeteria, which was right outside the art class. And those are the moments that you look back on. I mean, like it, it's like the, the movie, the blind side, where you see some of those recruiting scenes, like, that's a kid's dream, right? I mean, I'm talking to the most, one of the most famous active coaches in, 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 in history. He's called me, he's trying to recruit me. Like those experiences are crazy. I mean, it's with a uh, couple out of high, art class. Like my high school girlfriend was right there. It was just a cool experience. And then with Bob Stoops, I'm, I flew out to Norman, Oklahoma, took an unofficial visit and you have Bob Stoops in his pink uh, Mercedes. It was like his wife's car showing me around nor- the, the campus and, <laughs> Like he's recruiting me. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. I'm a kid from Sammamish, Washington, who uh, is out there with two of the most famous and best coaches of all time, trying to have me go play football for them and get a free education. It was just uh, two cool experiences, two conversations. Oklahoma's offensive coordinator ended up watching a a basketball game of mine. And they, uh, the the game, I, I, I threw it, I threw down a dunk and they uh, ended up offering me after like, so again, it was just little cool stuff like that was, uh, is stuff I'll always look back on it. How was your how was your hoop game? Like do you could you have gotten a full ride for 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 hooping as well? Nah, when I stopped playing AAU, I I, I lost my my dribbling ability and then uh I, I lost a little bit there. The 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 comp I use for my game is like a a, a Markeith Morris. So like I'm a good <laughs> I'm a good like uh, a bigger small forward, a smaller power forward. I can get out there, defend about three different positions. You kick a three ball to me, I'll knock it down, but I'll bring the intensity. Uh, I started for two years, so like I was solid, but I was I was definitely a role player, not a not a certified bucket getter. I was back, I wasn't uh, in in middle school, but not in high school. Um, and I feel like you already have the material for a fucking epic novel of all these life stories. Have you thought about putting a book together? I have, and. Um, there were some interesting years there where, uh, I mean, I was in Pittsburgh, like by myself for, for a lot of that time. And so you had a lot of time by myself and 
I, I would jot down things in my notes section. And then in, in 2018, when I was training for the NFL and rehabbing my shoulder, I would sit at Starbucks all the time and jot down notes and uh, just kind of flush out my brain. Uh, and that's one thing, maybe it's a good 2021 resolution. I need to be better at journaling because you always hear it all the time, but I wish I could go back and tap into that mentality, but I've definitely thought about writing a book. Um, I would love to write a book on my playing career and just life as a bust. And, and, and maybe there's the title of the book, but uh, definitely thought about it. I don't know what's going to get me over the hump to actually make it happen, but uh, it'll happen one day. I, I'm sure of it. I saw a couple of videos and I listened to the podca podcast with your girlfriend, Victoria, who played volleyball at SC, right? She did. Yep. She was a libero at SC. She's two grades behind me. I'm curious to know kind of the evolution over these last four or so years. What are some of the big takeaways that have allowed you guys to continue growing and evolving together? Uh, I think one, right when you asked that question, the long distance relationship we had, we had two different stints of uh, a year long relation, uh, long distance relationship in 2017 and 2019. And not to make this uh, a full relationship pod, but uh I think that was one of the most healthy things ever. I think it established, uh, it forced us to communicate in, in a healthy way. Um, and I think even more so, it allowed us both to establish two separate lives, which I think most couples do one life. And res I mean, respect, you got to do what you got to do. And once again, Gary V uh, principle, have self-awareness for what works for you. But for me, one thing that's brought a lot of happiness and fulfillment for us is we've had two separate lives that then we have now found a way to combine, combine together for one mega life, as I would like to say. And, and what I mean by that is Vic has her own pursuits and we had the perspective enough to allow me to go chase something in New York and chase something in Pittsburgh at that time. And Vic, she runs a very successful podcast. She's a full-time public speaker and, and podcast host. And she does that in her own right. And she does some cool things on my end. I'm still trying to figure it out. The reality is I'm behind her. I'm older than her, but I'm behind her professionally. I'm still trying to figure out my broadcasting career. I'm still trying to figure out my, my business career, but seeing her success, it motivates me. It drives me. It, it's not something that is a, a hit to my ego. Her success fires me up. Like that's my girlfriend. Like that's exciting. It's, it's cool seeing, ha having her, uh, have success, but just support the vision uh, of, of your significant other. And if the person really means that much to you, you'll find a way to make it work. And I think we have done that. And I'm grateful she allowed me to make some of these big jumps and go to Pittsburgh and go to New York and, and uh, take a minimum wage job. And I'm about to take another commission-based job. Like those are not things that all couples would be willing to take on but I think we both see the North star of where we want to get to. That's powerful. What would you say is like the number one, maybe the biggest thing that she's taught you during quarantine? Like what's the big, biggest thing that maybe you've learned from her during these last nine months? Vic works her ass off. And I think that's something that I feel like we, we both, both pride ourselves on, but from her specifically, I think, the, the, the work ethic has been is front of mind. I, I keep trying to come up with something different just to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more unique, but I mean, quarantine started right and back in, in March. And I remember uh, Vic had a lot of her speaking gigs canceled. She has uh, universities have her come speak to their athletes and their women's groups. And, and that's kind of how she makes a lot of her money. And uh, they were canceled, which I mean, she, she had that like a lot of people and right there, it was like, all right, what's the next step? What's the pivot? What, what, what can I do to, to elevate my brand and my business? She did not have a TikTok presence at all. And she buckled down and made like four TikToks a day. And now she has like 650,000 followers on TikTok since like April 1. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I, I believe you're, you're, you're big on TikTok as well, probably with, the, with a similar mentality. And uh, like, she just worked her ass off. And I think so often in life, we know what we need to do. We do. It's just a matter of, can we implement it in our life? And I'm guilty of this. I should be on TikTok. TikTok. I should be better. But Vic, she knew the deal. She buckled down. She made it happen. And now people always say, oh, like, of course, right? Vic has all these followers on TikTok. Like, of course, uh, of course she does. This is great. But like, no, I saw behind the, day, behind the scenes at the end of her day at four o'clock, like every single day, um, she's putting in a couple hours, getting those TikToks up and uh, her career's uh, 
really reaping the benefits of those uh, of those actions. And Max, you mentioned North Star. Um, I'm curious to know. I know this is kind of an ever evolving thing, but you're 25. You've had a few unique experiences post your playing career. What does that North Star look like to Max Brown right now? When it's all said and done, when uh, I'm, I'm an old guy, I want to leave a, a legacy in this world. I want to be part of things that were moving the needle forward. I think that's a big reason why I went and worked for a guy like Gary. I went and worked for a guy like Lewis Howes. Um, I, I went to USC and I didn't go to maybe a smaller school as I wanted to be, I want to be right on the sun. Like I, I want to be part of things that are moving the needle forward. And candidly, I, I kind of struggle with the what is your purpose question? I have not come across a good answer that really feels like it lights my heart on fire, but is also um, not like, yeah, it just, just, just feels authentic. I just, I feel like I've been blessed with a lot of, a lot of great qualities uh, that I'm thankful for. And I've also had a lot of life experiences that there's this internal fire in me that I feel like I need to put those to use and that I need to live a life where I take advantage of those things. And I just, uh, one, of, one of my other favorite Gary V things is just seeing regret on someone's face is like the most painful thing. And I think that is definitely the case in my life of, I don't have regrets in my playing career. I, I really don't. I really truly feel like I left, there's no stone left unturned. And that in itself has brought me so much peace post failure or post things not working out is I don't have regrets. And so there's this driving force in me to not have any regret. It's leaving a legacy. I think at the end of the day of, Hey man, that guy, he worked his ass off and he treated people right. And, uh, that that's just the legacy I want to live. And I think a lot of the, the whys and the hows and all that, I still like, I feel like I'm still trying to figure out in this post football life from five to 23, I lived life through a football first lens. And now at 25, it's just not the lens I'm living life through. And in large part, still trying to, trying to figure out uh, the, the steps in the past that I'm going to take. Yeah, I think that's really well said. I've, I heard Sad Guru say that, uh, that purpose is something that is, is, is just continuing to tap into your curiosities. And like, what are those things that you are curious about? Like maybe you were curious about when you were eight or nine, but you weren't really able to pursue them fully because of football or another obligation. Are there any curiosities that you can think of maybe that you are excited to tap into in the near future? Funny you say that because right now I mentioned that I'm trying to get into commercial real estate and I've had some early success in broadcasting. And there's a lot of people that in my life um, or not, or just people that say, Oh, why aren't you going all in on broadcasting? Like, Oh, what about broadcasting? What about broadcasting? And I still want to do broadcasting. I still want that to be a core part of my professional life. But there's also part of me that for my entire life, I've always been Max Brown, the quarterback. I've always been Max Brown, the sports guy. And I don't see myself as a guy who talks sports every single morning, all day and all night, because the reality is my football career wasn't the best. And so there's part of me that I like, I really like football. And there is that curiosity that you talk about. Um, that I do want to go explore other things. And so right now, real estate's front of mine. Uh, I go through books phases and podcasting phases, and maybe I'll be a, a host like yourself. And I'll st the, the, the content world will always be front of mind to me, having worked for Gary and for Lewis. I mean, little things like I'm a wine guy now. I'm, a, I'm diving into whiskey a little bit, not to go like full hey. like alcohol mode, but hey, you know, so often in life, we, we, we're, we're pegged to kind of this one lane. And I hope that my, my adult life is multiple lanes. And that's how it is for the guys I look up to. I think also what those guys both embody is like they have big hearts and they're using their platform. They're using all of the income to generate more impact in the world. And I feel like, I don't know about you, but I feel like growing up for me, like in a Jewish family, you know, there's a lot of scarcity mindset around money. Uh, it's like, it's like we make money, we save money, but it's like sometimes spending it or just like treating ourselves to something is frowned upon. And we have this mindset about money that money's the root of all evil. But with people like you and myself, it's like, no, we have more money. We have more resources. That means we can help more people and ultimately leave a greater legacy. 
that is perfectly worded uh, abundance mindset and in, in all of life but yeah especially with finances you get it gets pegged in a negative light a selfish light but the reality is money is a tool money can be a tool and uh i think it's up to the person to be self-aware and have the perspective and make sure they're not going down an ego trip and not doing the money just so they can buy a range rover to impress their high school friends and all that no it's having money to like you said leave an impact and i said legacy earlier but impacts right there legacy and impact in this world world that to me is how you get fulfillment and fulfillment is uh the fast track to happiness and happiness should be the North star for all of us. Uh, and so whatever that, wh whatever that means for you in terms of the fulfillment thread, I know for me, that's what, that's the, that's the path I'm trying to get, uh, get going down. Max, I'm curious to know, bro. So it's your last meal, right? Uh, you've left, you've left that incredible legacy. You've impacted millions of people through your storytelling, through all of the other work that you've done exploring all those curiosities you get to have your final supper with three people uh, they can be dead or alive i'm curious to know who are those three people and what are you having on the on the dinner table uh, are we talking like like people outside my family because i feel like family, exactly yeah all right outside my family those that are listening and know me they already know the first one uh and the first one's gonna be lebron i'm a huge lebron guy if you can see the other wall right there um that'd be him. i just admire a lot of the, the the subjects we've talked about in terms of wearing pressure living up to expectations all those things sure his play on the basketball court i love that obviously but i, I just i love what he's about so lebron's one uh who else you got to go in different ages a little bit so i'd probably go like abraham lincoln um, hey. i'll throw him in there i mean uh we're talking about a little good guy abe um and i just think it'd be sick to to to, to talk to abraham lincoln and then the last spot yeah the last spot um i'll go i'll go with the rock I'll go the rock, uh, LeBron and the rock both have different tequila lines. So we'll see, uh, we'll see how LeBron has a tequila line or he's like, uh, I saw recently, I got notifications for it. It's called Lobos. He's like a, uh, chair chairman partner. I'll, 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 I'll shoot you a link after this, but, uh, yeah, so we'll see if Abraham Lincoln can uh, can hold his weight there. But those will be my final three. A lot of topics discussed in that video. We went from the recruiting story to the college playing days to the transition out of athletics. But if you've got to this point in the video, please drop a comment down below with your favorite nugget. Hearing what resonates with you guys motivates me to keep talking on those subjects. I'm excited to have this lane of content be a pillar on my YouTube channel. We'll be back with a player profile whiteboard chalk talk video on Tuesday. But hope you enjoyed this one. See you guys next time.